excited in our seats. Let's focus our minds in on the Lord and all that He is to us and all that He just He is, whether it's for us, whether it's personal or not, just His greatness, His sovereignty. He sits on His throne. on him tonight and rest in his presence. Let's sing together, church. You are the first and the last.
and the last, and it's such a beautiful co um, concept to remember tonight. Um, God, we, we find rest in your presence knowing that. God, be exalted higher than any person, any person in this place, any name. You are the one, you are the one that deserves attention. You are the one who deserves affection and praise. We give it to you, God, wholeheartedly and willingly. We bless you. We want to teach you a new song tonight. It's called The One Who Saves.
my mind as we're just thinking about worship tonight and thinking about what that means. Worship is exalting the Lord higher above anything. And one thing that we like to do as human beings is try to steal God's glory. Because sometimes we probably like to sing the song, how great I am. Look at me, how great I am. Listen to me sing. Look at what I'm wearing. Look what I've done with my life. Look how spiritual I am. Would you examine your heart right now? And that's a hard thing to do, but ask God to search you, tell you there's any offensive way in your heart, and to just purge you of those things. If, you, if you're being a, a glory of God thief in this place tonight, would you allow the Holy Spirit to point that out and lay that down? Because it's a hard thing to hear, but it's not about us. It's not about you know a gathering or being the biggest and the best and the coolest. I mean, we are truly here to lift up the one who's great, the one who has the name that is higher than any other name, any, any, uh, my name, your name, it's higher. And his ways are higher and he is so much smarter than we are and his ways are so much better than our ways. Would you step out of the way his glory tonight? And I just want to sing this a few more times and just allow the Holy Spirit to purge us of any stealing in this place tonight that we're trying to take the glory of God. anybody else is in the same boat that I am tonight, that they would also ask for forgiveness for trying to steal your glory. So often I, I want it to be about me. God, it's not about me. And I just acknowledge that before your people. But as a worship leader, I'm to lead them to you, to love you, to look at you. Father, and I just, I confess selfishness tonight. And, God, this is about you and your glory. And you will share your glory with no one. And I thank you that even though we try to take your glory, you're merciful to us. And you don't kill us. God, we thank you for that. We thank you that, that we are precious in your sight, even though we're sinful. We thank you that um, the blood of your precious son um, covers us tonight. And we stand um, in your presence with confidence because of what you've done. And that's just one of the many reasons, God, that we exalt and glorify you and you alone in this place. And God, I just pray that that's, that's what takes place here tonight, that your name above anyone else is exalted. Be glorified, be lifted high, and we know that when we lift you high, when we glorify you, that men will be drawn to you, God, as you are uh, manifested before us your glory. We bless you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Okay, came to college, I guess, three years ago. I'm a senior. So 2008. Um, came with my sister. She was a year older than me. And so we both came together, and I didn't live in the dorms just to save money. So we both got an apartment and um, didn't know about foundation or anything, just kind of came 
um, and also came with a guy I dated all throughout high school um, for three years, and so I had a very small group of friends that I knew. I grew up a Christian, but I didn't really think about getting involved in a church uh, my first semester here. I don't know why I just kind of get caught up in starting school and everything else, and so thought about Russian Greek and it just didn't work out. I just didn't want to spend the money for it, so just didn't get involved in a whole lot. So just kind of jumped into classes and um, every weekend I told my sister or my boyfriend, we're going to go to church or we're going to find a church and I just never did. Um, and I just thought it would kind of fall into place or someone would invite me. And I remember it was getting towards like October, November and I still hadn't stepped into church once and I just felt so far from God and just I don't know, because I had grown up all my life, not just being a Christian, but the example my mom led, like loving God. And um, she just really showed who I, what a Christian walk was, and I wasn't at all living that. And uh, let's see, January, I remember one night I got in a fight with my boyfriend. I went to my apartment, and I was just alone because there's no one to go talk to, no friends. Um, my sister, me and her weren't getting along, my family. Um, so I just remember falling to my knees in my little apartment, which was way on the outskirts of La Baker, closer. So I, I felt so far distant from everyone. I didn't feel like a freshman in college because I felt like I didn't have community or anybody. And I remember just crying out to God and just um, telling him, hey, I need you and I haven't been living for you and I miss you. Just show me one Christian on this campus. If you can show me one Christian, then I'll come to church. I don't know. I just, I don't know why I prayed that, but that was my prayer that night. And so. Um, I remember the next day, it was a Wednesday, and I was in chemistry class, and I sat down, and it was a huge lecture hall, and, it, and I just remember this guy sits down in front of me and opens up his Bible and just started reading the whole entire lecture, didn't even pay attention to the lecture, and I just thought, wow, like that, it's, that's my prayer, like God just answered my prayer. And, um, so the next day, I called my brother because when he went to tech, he was really involved, and he's like, well, I, I knew about Paradigm. Um, I was really involved there when John Randall was there. Um, it's awesome. And so I just looked it up. I asked my boyfriend, I asked my sister if they wanted to go, and nobody um, wanted to go, so I knew like God was leaving it up to me. I was on my own, and so I walked in um, to Paradigm, and I just remember I didn't know anybody. I was by myself, and I just sat at the back, and I just... Here in Laney Lead Worship, um, I just felt God there for the first time um, that freshman year, and I just started crying and um, just so happy just because I felt like I was at home. I remember they talked about missions, it, even though it's January, they talked about the spring break missions, and they said, if you want to meet friends and your life to change, sign up. Um, we're having sign ups tonight or something, and I was like, okay, I'm signing up. So I didn't know anybody, but that night I went home and signed up, and I just from right before the mission trip, like all this stuff happened to keep me from going. Like I lost my job, I broke up with my boyfriend, and, but I went on that trip and it changed my life. And um, I, God gave me a group of girlfriends that I are my closest friends and sisters in Christ. And um, since then, I just continue to grow. And now I'm a senior. And um, Paradigm and First Baptist have been my family and what shaped me and um, it helped me to become who I am today. But it took me. I guess rebelling my entire first semester at Tech and then up until the point where I was so alone in my apartment on my knees where God could really finally reach me and, and, and use me and change my life and turn me around. So I'm Amy Mountain and I rebel. That was Amy. Hey, I'm, uh, I'm glad to be here tonight and I'm glad that you are here. It is, uh, it's a pretty good night, isn't it? It's a pretty good night. You know, uh, Christina, my wife, and I moved here uh, to Lubbock this past summer in June. And, and before we moved, we were told, man, Lubbock is great. The, the weather is great. And, um, you know, you'll, you'll enjoy your evenings. And, 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 and over and over, people kept telling us, uh, uh, you know, it's never like this in Lubbock. I mean, the, the weather is just crazy. This year is so crazy and different. It, the weather is never like this. And so today, today happens, and, um, and it's still October, and it starts to snow in, in, in Lubbock. And, uh, and so Christina and I are very excited about this. And, uh, 
And all I get from this is a welcome to Lubbock. This is how it is. Finally, finally, we have, uh, we have found out what Lubbock is really like. Um, the weather is, is going to stay the same. It's going to be typical, I guess. Tonight, um, we are, we're going to talk about worship. The focus of tonight is worship, multidimensional worship of, of not just singing songs, standing and singing a song, not just um, uh, doing the same old thing, but uh, you're going to see some different stuff. And we want you to um, experience worship differently than maybe you have ever in your life before. Um, and so each element of, of our worship service tonight is designed to, to open your eyes to this new thing. Because really we want you to, uh, to see how worship is not just this one event a week or two events a week or, or maybe even three events a week. It is every part of your life. It is in your blood. And... Uh, and God is worthy, and he's on his throne. And so he's, it's every part of our life has to be worship. Every part of it. You know, we sing this song, How Great Is Our God. And, and I was sitting there thinking, how great is he? Really, how, how great is he? And what, what in our lives prove um, that, that God is great? And we really believe that God is great. And he is the name above all names. Do we just sing that one time a week, or, or is it every, is it more than one time a week? Can we just, can we, can we do more than sing that? Can we proclaim it to the people that we know, and can we preach it? I want to take you back in time tonight, not really, uh, but I want you to think about uh, what it was like, because I think, I think God is, has not changed in what he wants of, of his people from the very beginning of time. And if you were to go back and you can study how, however far back you want to go. Uh, and God, I believe God has required one thing, one thing of his people. And that one thing dictates everything else that happens after that. And we find it in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, where he says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And with all your might, love God. With everything that you are, love him. And so when we love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might, it becomes more. It becomes more than just a song. But it becomes the life that we live. And it's been this way from the very beginning. You go back. You do your own study. Go back. And look at the Old Testament worship. Go back to Abraham. Go back to Adam and Eve. Go back to Cain and Abel. Whatever you want to do. And the thing that God requires of people is that he, they love him. And they love him more than they love anything else in this world. Because the verses following Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5 say, Write this on your arms and talk about it in your house. And everything that you do, talk about this. How you love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. It has been this way from the beginning. We cannot separate heart from soul from might. Think about that. What would that look like? You separate, your, you take the might out of the heart that is in it. And you're just sitting around doing nothing, but you have a good heart about it, right? And you, you love it, but you're not doing anything. And you take the heart out of the might, Right? And you get burnout, and you're just doing this same thing over and over, and it gets old. It gets old. Everything in us is to be directed at God. You go through history. The prophets, man, they said some ugly things to the people to turn their hearts back to God that they would love him because they did not love him alone. They were running to different places, wherever they could find it. There's a thing that we need to remember, though, as we come to worship services like this. We have to remember this glimpse that we get of God in 1 Samuel 16, 7, where it says, For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You cannot separate heart, soul, might. Because God is watching. Because God is on his throne. And he is great. And he is the name above all names. And like Lanny said, we're sitting there and we're trying to steal his glory. 
sitting in our little chair in front of him. He's looking at our hearts. And so whatever motive you might have tonight or tomorrow or Sunday or whenever, the Lord is looking at your heart and he's looking at my heart. In the Old Testament, I keep referring back to that, in the Old Testament, worship was a sacrifice. Bring in the bull. Bring in the goat and chop him up. Give it to God. That is, what, um, that is how the people of that day and time expressed their love to God. They brought in the bull. And we don't do that anymore. We don't, we don't do that. It was their sacrifice. But the thing about worship today that we can take from this worship of bringing in the sacrifice of the bull is that worship is still a sacrifice, even though we don't bring in the bull. But we bring ourselves to worship. Because really what worship is... What worship is, is taking ourselves off of that throne that we try to put ourselves on, moving out of the way of God, and letting His glory shine, and praising Him for who He is and how great He is. That is worship, and it takes sacrifice. It goes against the natural flow of what we want to do as humans. And it is a sacrifice. If you read Psalm 50, the one who, it says, the one who offers thanksgiving as a sacrifice glorifies me. And so, think, so really, if you were to go back into it, you know, just bringing the bull was not it. The sacrifice of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving that God is who he is. And God is as good as he says he is. That's what glorifies God. Uh, we've seen it in Romans 12. In view of God's mercy, offer your bodies, offer yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. For this is your spiritual act of worship. Offer yourselves in worship. And then Galatians 2, I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And so we've got to move out of the way. We've got to sacrifice ourselves and move out of the way and worship God for who he is. The reason we worship is because we are thirsty. Our worship begins with loving God with all our heart and all our soul and all our might. But the reason that we worship God is because we are thirsty. And you've probably heard this before. We are thirsty for anything. Anything. And so, guys, can I speak to you first? Are you there? You're watching the Rangers game. <laughs> Sorry. I, had, I was trying to figure out how I was going to pull it in. Guys, you're here. You're here. What we want, guys, in this life and what we will do to accomplish... Wait, I just gave it away. What we will do, what we will worship is what brings us accomplishment. What makes us feel like we have done something in this world. And we can look back on our lives and point to something tangibly that I have done. I have accomplishments. So think about this. And, and we will even, uh, whatever we can associate with that brings accomplishment, that, that works too. So think about this in our lives. What is it? What is it that we are really worshiping that will bring us accomplishment other than God? We are thirsty people. We will associate with whatever team will fulfill our accomplishment, and we can claim that we, we, we will consider ourselves a part of the team to accomplish that championship, you know, that might happen tonight. It might. We can, whatever. I mean, you, accomplishment. We can build remote control cars and race them 40 miles an hour and jump them 15 feet, whatever brings you accomplishment. All right, girls, your turn. And I won't, I won't spend as much time on you because I just don't know who you are. Girls, what you want, what you want is, is security in this life, right? Maybe not all of you. Not all of us guys want accomplishment. Just about all of us. But you want security. And so think about this. Marketers will feed into this. And, and going back to guys too, whatever will bring you accomplishment is what they will try to sell you. And whatever, girls, whatever brings you security, they will try to sell that to you. And so however smooth your skin can be, that's what they'll sell to you. 
And however big and great a guy can be, that's what they're trying to sell to you. They know. They know what we want to worship. And if, if it's a group, we, we want community. And so if we can sell community, we're making money at this point. They feed off of what we are thirsty for and what we worship. It's interesting. It's interesting. The problem with this, the problem with all of this is that we live in a limited and destructive world. Limited in that it will let you down as quick as it fills you up. It will either let you down or you will get bored with it. And so Chicago Cubs fan here, 108, 104 years, I think. It'll be 108 probably. We're waiting on a championship to happen. And it has not happened in 100 years. It is, it's tough. It's tough, I'm telling you. But our world is limited. The video game will be over one day, won't it? There's only, I mean, it's going to game over. And then, you, and then you have to download the zombie version of the game <laughs> and keep playing it. You know. It's limited and it is destructive. I don't know if you know anybody that's, that, uh, that has an addiction that they cannot shake and it is destroying their lives. And when we fill our lives with, we try to quench that thirst of uh, in our lives with things of this world, it will either bring us to boredom or it will destroy our lives. We worship because we are thirsty and God is the only one who will quench that thirst. Do you remember what he told the woman at the well? In John chapter four, I am the well that won't run dry, so drink up. I'm the spring of life, all you want. It won't run dry. So we have got to, when we worship, because we are thirsty, we've got to worship God. Because he is unlimited and he is not destructive. I want to take you really quick as we finish out to Psalm 63, would you? If you turn there with me. Psalm 63. Once you get there, you're going to notice something. Before we get to the actual verses, Psalm 63, 1, you're going to see a note there. And it says, a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. And I wanted to set this up for you. The wilderness of Judah. What's going on in the wilderness of Judah? Do you know? You've been there? You've been there? David is running for his life. And it's one thing to run from, for your life from your enemies. And those who you know are, going to, are trying to take your life. It's another thing when you're running for your life from your own son. Absalom, David's son, is pursuing his own father so he can take his life and take his throne. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? And David is in the wilderness of Judah. And he's looking around with his people and his mighty men at his surroundings. And the water is is gone and the food is gone and people are pursuing his life and in that moment he writes this song oh god you are my god earnestly i seek you my soul thirsts for you my flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water so i've looked upon you in the sanctuary Beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. And my mouth will praise you with joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed. And meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. And your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down to the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for the jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exult, for the mouths of liars will be stopped. In the wilderness, David writes, and he is thinking in the present when he says, my soul thirsts for you in a dry and weary land. He is looking around in the present. And when all else has fa failed him, physical nourishment and water, 
He's looking to God and saying, you are the one that I thirst for. He is looking in the past. I have looked upon you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. He remembers being in Jerusalem and worshiping God there and offering that sacrifice. And he is looking into the future. And he says, because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. David found a way to worship in the wilderness when he had nothing else. He had no accomplishment at this point. He had no security. Everything else had left him dry and thirsty. And he's looking to God in worship. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. My lips will praise you. So when we come to worship and when we go about our day-to-day life and we are trying to fill our lives with accomplishment and security and community and it keeps running dry, it is because God's steadfast love is better than those things. It is better than life. It is better than us standing in his way and trying to receive the glory. And so our lips will praise him. And so each element tonight, we're going to see some more videos of people who are living this out. And we're going to continue to worship him because his steadfast love is better than life. Can I pray with you? God, you are great. You're great. And you're on your throne right now. And you're looking at our hearts. God, your steadfast love is better than life. You are worthy of our praise and our worship. So tonight and for every day for the rest of our lives, may we love you with all of our heart and with all of our soul and with all of our might. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. They say football is life in West Texas. They say... Being a good athlete is life. But what happens when it's over? What happens when football's over? What happens when you can't play sports anymore? If that's your life, what happens then? When I was growing up, things things were rough. My mom was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis when I was around 10 years old. Um, She passed away when I was in ninth grade. I have three brothers and a sister. We kind of had to raise ourselves. And that's kind of where my hard headedness comes from. It comes from no one can tell me anything because I've done it on my own. I played football in high school and uh, I, I, I was pretty good. I, I was pretty good. Good enough to, to get exposure and to get a scholarship offer from several schools and I, and I chose to go to Texas Tech. When I first got there, man, I was, I was, a, I was a hothead. Just thinking that I had the world in a, in a chokehold. I was bringing my A game in life. That I knew, I knew what I was doing. I knew I was doing it right. I honestly believed that the success that I had achieved was, uh, it was only going to get better by me doing it the way I thought I should do it, and um, and that, that was absolutely not true. I like to just equate it like this, that if, you, if you're a thousand steps away from God, which I was, God will take 999 steps just so you'll take that one. October 18th, 2006, I'm blocking a linebacker in, in team drills and someone just rolls on my ankle and like that, I'm just down. They took me in, got x-rays, 
and that quick that it's it's just done there's no fixing it you have to get surgery so after i had my my first surgery that the swelling never really went down i went in for my second surgery six weeks after my first and i wake up and, and i come to and the doctor's looking at me and i was like how how'd the surgery go he said no it did it didn't go good i said well what what does that mean what, what does that mean? What do you, I mean, what are you trying to tell me? They said, well, we got to do another surgery and clean it out. And you know, the, the same thing went on, I mean, five other times. Every time waking up, hoping that the nightmare was over. I was ready to quit. I, I was ready to quit. My identity was gone. God had taken my identity in, in the person who I said I was, which was a college athlete, and took it from me. Yanked the rug right out from underneath me. All my friends that I thought were my friends never came and saw me, never came and really visited. It was two guys that I really didn't talk too much on the team came and said, Baron, God has a plan for you. I was skeptic. I was mad at I was mad at God. I still didn't want to just get the hint that God had put a roadblock. God had removed all the distractions and the one big distraction that was keeping me from Him, and and that was football. I eventually started going to going to church, started going to Bible studies, and changing my life in little ways. I started reading the Word, getting in the Word more, and it started small. It started with baby steps. Eventually, the ankle got better. The infection went away. It was not an overnight transformation. It was not one of those things you wake up and your legs heal and I start dancing around. And I say, God, you healed me. It wasn't one of those. Oh man, after that, things got, things got harder after that. But slowly, things started to change in my life. I said, God, I know I'm a screw up. I know I'm a screw up. You know I'm a screw up. I understand that, that you gave me these talents and these abilities and I spit on them. I spit all over them. I disrespected the things that you gave me and, and tried to claim them for, for myself to bring glory for me. And I remember the first time I put back on my cleats and went back out to play. The feeling that I had knowing that the only reason I was out there was because God put me back out there. To me, Jesus dying on the cross is the ultimate act of love and the ultimate act of obedience. That's why when I score touchdowns, I don't, I don't pound my chest anymore. I don't pound my chest or, or point to my jersey so people can see my number or the name on the back of my jersey. I don't do I don't do it. All I can do every time I get in the end zone is point up. I point up and say thank you God. Thank you God because you are so 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 faithful. You were faithful when, when I wasn't. You were faithful when I laughed at you. You were faithful when I said I didn't want to have a part of you. But yet somehow you turned all of that into a powerful testimony. I have two scars on my ankle on the left and right side. And uh, I think that God gives us scars sometimes to, to remind us where we've been and more importantly that, that he's healed us. And then once we have those scars, we can show people and, and say, look, this is what God's done for me. My name is Baron Batch, and I am second. Hi guys, my name is Paige, and I have been attending Paradigm since I was a freshman, and it's definitely poured into me and shaped me to be the person that I am today. Over here I have Katie, 
and she is going to be signing with me today. And then Thomas Doolin, who has been gifted with the music ability, and he's so talented. Allie, who plays the violin. And then Kelsey's also signing with me. About um, four years ago, I was at a church camp, and God spoke to me and said, learn sign language. And I remember thinking, what on earth? Like, that's crazy, you know, like never been around it too much, but he sought me out. And, it, and because of that, I ran many times. I ran and I was like, this isn't, this isn't something that I need to do, but um, it's by faith that I stand here today and just trust that God is using me. And I am so passionate about what I do. And, and then back over spring break, I went to Bogota, Colombia, and it changed my life, it changed my life drastically. And God called me to be a worship leader. And that doesn't mean stand here on the stage and sing to you. It's how I live my life and how I portray Christ in my life. And that's another thing I'm so passionate about. And so tonight as I sing, I'm gonna be singing in Spanish and signing. I would love to invite you to worship with me just to, to glorify God. And God gave me this beautiful picture of just in heaven one day when every tribe, every tongue, every nation comes together and um, worships the Lord just like how amazing that's going to sound and just how beautiful. And that's, that's exactly what I wanna do with y'all tonight is just come together and worship that Jesus is the only one that can satisfy and the only one that can bring hope into our lives. And so if you know this song, please, please feel free to sing with me.
we're just going to share a quick verse with y'all. Um, obviously, the Bible is full of many, many ways to worship God, and um, we just want y'all to keep that in mind as we go through tonight. Um, but tonight, we're going to read Psalms 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His acts of power. Praise Him for His surpassing greatness. Praise Him for the sounding of, with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise Him with the harp and lyre. Praise Him with tambourine and dancing. Praise Him with the strings and flute. Praise Him with the clash of cymbals. Praise Him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, I just thank you so much for tonight, God, for showing us that worship can be through so many different ways, God, whether that's through sign language, God, um, through English or Spanish, Lord. Um, you know all things, God, and you know our hearts especially, for, um, Lord. And I just pray that tonight um, that you would just enter into all of our hearts, God. Just let our focus be solely on you and not on ourselves, God. Um, take us off that pedestal, God, and just allow us to humble ourselves and come before you. Um, Father, just continue to move in this place tonight, Father, and just touch our hearts, touch our lives, God, and just let us live every single moment of our lives to glorify you. In your precious name we pray. Amen.
always been raised in a Christian home, a loving, loving home. I have unbelievable parents. It's unbelievable parents. And um, ever since a young age, I've, I've heard the name of Jesus. Whenever my sister came to know Christ, uh, that, that made me ask a few questions. Um, but I just knew I wanted what she had because I felt like she was above me. And um, because of that, I, I, very soon after that, I, I made a profession of faith, I guess, and, and wanted to go down to the front of the church like my sister did and um, know, um, just do what she did. That's what, that's what I wanted. After that, um, no change happened. I, I did that at a young age. At eight years old, I did that, and um, nothing changed after that. I had a girlfriend uh, throughout most of high school, um, and this particular girlfriend, uh, I found out four days before I came to Texas Tech, and she had cheated on me a bunch. <laughs> and um, that was kind of a destroying point in my life. So I came to college, and of course college, you're thrown with so many temptations that have never been laid out in front of you before. Absolutely, um, you can do. You can start over. You can be. A, you can be a new person. You can, if you're once conservative, you can, you know, be, go crazy in college because you have the opportunity to. You're no longer under the umbrella of your parents' protection or anything like that. You can. You can do whatever you do. Whatever you want. Um, and that's kind of what I was planning on doing uh, after finding out my devastating news from my, from my girlfriend. I came to a point just sitting in my dorm room uh, the very first week of school, uh, utterly, utterly broken, um, just des destroyed inside and not understanding um, life or anything. And, I resorted back to my head knowledge of what I knew about Jesus, and um, I remember just on my knees in my door, in the middle of my dorm room, just saying, "God, if you are real, and if what you've done for me through Jesus is real, take me. I, everything, I, this life, I've I've messed it up. I I haven't done anything. <laughs> I haven't done anything to." bring you glory, I know that for sure. Um, I haven't done anything to, um, I guess to, just to love you or to act like I knew you. Um, I want all that to change. I want all that to change with all my heart. I want you to, to bring me peace, joy, and happiness where I've tried to fill that with other things. And um, from that moment, I know this in my heart, with my whole heart, from that moment, uh, uh, Christ was dwelling within me and I was I was new I was being transformed I was um, in everything I did for I remember for the first three months I'd gone to I literally was born and raised in the church my entire life for 18 years I'd probably gone to church every single Sunday and um, whenever I opened up the word after that night of complete brokenness and desiring Jesus for the first time Everything was in new light. Everything had new meaning. Everything had purpose, and I saw it. I saw it in a way that I'd never seen it before. It all made sense. I, I mean, in my mind, I, it sounded familiar, but also in my heart, it was something brand new and totally, totally life-changing. So, with the help of my my newfound Lord and Savior um, Jesus, I, I was able to to go against. Uh, you know, the, the desires that are so attractive to everyone whenever they first come to college. I was able to, to rebel against, you know, lust and, and drinking and partying and girls and um, everything that is so attractive by the, the, world's, um, the world's standard. My name is Cody McMurray and I rebelled. We're going to sing a few more songs, but before we do, I just want to share my heart about um, what worship means to me. 
I looked at the definition of worship, and there's many definitions, but I really liked this one. It says to love, admire, or respect somebody or something greatly, and perhaps and perhaps excessively or unquestioningly. And just as Cody was saying early earlier, um, worship just all boils down to the scripture that tells us to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might. We do a lot of different things to express our love for the Lord. We do a lot of things to cultivate our love for the Lord. But when those things, the vehicles that we use to get to love God more, when they become what we love, then it's no longer worship of God. It's worship of those things. And that's why I love this next song, um, The Heart of Worship, because um, Matt Redman wrote the song and um, they did a uh, musical fast at their church for a while because they just really felt like they had set their hearts on the vehicle to get them to worship. And they began to worship um, the means rather than the God that they originally wanted to worship. And so they just stripped it all away and re really began to search their hearts and, and um, begin to question, you know, who do I love? What do I love more? Do I love the experience of worship, that feeling that I get, the sounds of singing worship, being with other people, or do I truly just love the God I worship? And um, so that's my challenge to you tonight is, you know, we've seen a lot of different expressions tonight, and, and I don't want to downplay any of the expressions because the Lord commands us to sing to Him and to make music to Him. Because I truly believe that that engages our emotions with the Lord. Um, I, be I believe wholeheartedly that God created music to bring Him glory. And we can use it for our pleasure all, all day long. And I know it's for our pleasure too. But I think that the first and foremost purpose behind music is to um, just take us to another level in understanding of God and, and emotions and, and affections toward Him. Because, you know, I could um, speak the lines of this song and then sing you the lines of the song and the music somehow God uses it to just engage your heart and your your emotions into what you're saying and um, so like I said I don't want to downplay music but um, just question yourself right now as we sing the song the heart of worship where's your heart truly tonight is it is it on the one that you love the Lord God or is, on, is it on the means that, that we use to, to help us cultivate that love? And I know that's a little vague tonight, but I hope you understand that. Um, so let's stand together and um, let's sing this, this precious song, The Heart of Worship, and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you.
pray for us and we're gonna sing one more song. Father, I, I love you so much. and God, I just pray that you would just keep reminding us that it truly is all about you. And God, we just, we need to love you more. God, when we love you more, everything else just lines up. God, when we seek first your kingdom, we seek you first, seek to love you first, God, everything else just falls into place. God, I pray that the things that we use to help cultivate that love would not dethrone you, God, so to speak. God, they would just be vehicles, God, to help us God, to deepen those emotions and expressions and affections toward you. And they would remind us to live pure lives. I know that that's where true worship lies, lies God, and um, God, we want to honor you. We continue to sing to you tonight, and we know that it's not the song that brings you worship, but it's the hearts that sing it. So we sing in sincerity tonight. We love you.
announcements. The best time of the night. Yes, sir. All right, a couple announcements. Raise your hand if you drink a lot of water. Okay, cool. Well, let's, let's see the hands again. Man, y'all are excited. Okay, so because you raised your hand, I can tell there's so much interest. There's a booth in the back called Project H2O. Um, they're uh, looking for help and interest and questions and friendly smiles for people that want to uh, participate in um, supporting building a well in Rwanda. If you're interested about that, go see them. Um, it's three ladies. Um, at least go say hi. Go say hi. You know what I mean? Okay. Uh, next announcement. Um, Sky Ranch. It's a Christian camp. Uh, they're recruiting um, on tech. They're especially recruiting in the back. Um, if you want to go talk to them, basically they look for um, overnight counselors and summer staff to work with kids anywhere between six and 17 years old. Um, and yeah, you can go see uh, Tyler and Rachel in the back if you're interested, and um, they'll hook you up. I can't hear you all tonight. Okay. Uh, all right, Jeff, you got an announcement? Sweet. <laughs> all right, I have a. Uh, uh, one thing I want to share with you, and it's just appropriate. We've been talking about worship, and we have worship, and it's been incredible. I've been sitting there listening about his love endures. Let me tell you something. Um, you'll have to agree with me. The world needs to hear that, does it not? That his love endures. Um, your neighbors need to hear that and, and here at Tech, but the world needs to hear that. Um, and we sing, it's not, it's not about us, it's about you and, and uh, about him. And uh, so I want to present to you just an opportunity and share with you, and you can meet us at the back and talk with us back there. Uh, one of uh, uh, you guys, uh, Richard, is back there as well, Richard Brennan, who will also uh, serve as through Go Now Missions. Uh, but there's mission opportunities uh, for you to serve this summer, and uh, we'd love to present those to you and share what they are. Now, when you automatically think about missions, sometimes you think about, well, you're going to work with kids, you're going to do this. This year, there's actually, they're wanting a couple of guys to go to a place actually to play football and to practice with a team overseas in order to build relationships with them. So they need some extra practice guys. Can you believe that? There's actually some people that want to, there's, to work in some orphanages. There's they're working in pregnancy crisis centers. There's those who are going to work in prisoners in Huntsville, uh, Texas. There's refugee places. There's all sorts of places to serve. And so sometimes we get thinking, now oh, there's one place and this kind of thing, but it's wherever you're gifted, wherever you're talented, there's places like that. Guys, there's actually an outdoors church that they're wanting some guys to come out with. I think you just basically, you have worship and eat barbecue every week, okay? I mean, what a deal is that, all right? And there's places where you're gonna hike up and you're gonna find unreached people groups in different parts of the world. So there's all sorts of different opportunities here. What I encourage you to do is just come by, come back there, take a book, uh, and just begin praying about it. And even if you feel like you don't want to go, you can pray for the places. What a great way to pray for the world, but to pray for each of these places. So begin to pray for those places. And we would love to visit with you more about what that involves, what Go Now Missions, what it takes, the training that's involved with it, and everything else. It's a great organization, a way to send us out. Worship will fuel missions. And missions will fuel worship. Why is that? Because we get an idea of who God is, and we cannot commend that which we don't cherish. But we go around and we see what God's doing around, around the world and we get in a group or we go to Africa or we go to wherever God leads us and I guarantee you that's gonna fuel our worship. Why? Because we're gonna see God do incredible things in the lives of three people. And we're gonna worship all different sort of ways and all different sort of folks. It's gonna be an exciting thing. So we'd love to visit with you about that. All right, that's one of the things I'm most excited about our partnership with, uh, with the BSM here at Tech and Paradigm is this is one of the ways right here. Uh, so we want to visit with you and talk with you about that. The second announcement is really, is really pretty simple. It's this. It's tomorrow night as uh, we do another Pancakes on Broadway. Yeehaw. Go Tech. All right? So if you want to join us, uh, you'll meet us at our building at, at 10 o'clock right behind Varsity Bookstore, about a block behind Varsity, Varsity Bookstore, and we'll kind of pray and plan together. If you just want to come out there right at 11 o'clock and kind of start helping, that's cool too. But it's going to be an exciting night. It's going to be cold, which means we break out the hot chocolate. All right? Yes, is what I'm saying. You have to drink about five gallons of it to stay warm, and it about destroys your kidneys, but it is so worth it, okay? So we would love to have you come and, and be a part of that uh, tomorrow night, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at the back and visiting with you about 
opportunities for you to get involved in what God's doing. So thanks so much, Kyle. Thanks, Jeff. How you doing? Sweet, okay, plug your ears. All right, so the news that really matters is it's 4-4 at the bottom of the six for the Rangers. Yeah, I mean, we're trying. Okay, so uh, kind of now the usuals. Paradigm, here, next Thursday, Michael Kelly. Who likes Michael Kelly? Raise your hand. See, that was more exciting than water. Are you kidding me? Okay. Um, yeah, Michael Kelly, great dude, great speaker. Um, he'll be here next Thursday. Um, it'll be the usual, it be here. Um, the dude will put perspective, he'll put imagery. Um, he'll allow you to really um, put some food for thought on your brain. Um, it sticks. T-shirts, we have some new t-shirts in the back. You know Paradigm, you know how we roll, like we never get the same shirt. So if you like it, buy it, or bribe a friend, or beg a friend, or suck up to a friend, however it works. Um, if you like it, I would go and take advantage of it now. Um, our website, Paradigm Texas Tech, if this is your first time, um, thanks for coming. I hope you enjoyed tonight. For those of you all that come all the time, I hope you enjoy tonight as well. Um, community groups. Uh, here at First Baptist, um, we have a way to plug in with college students, community groups. If you're interested, go to our, our Facebook, um, Paradigm Texas Tech, once again. Boiler Room is on Tuesday nights at 9. You all know this. Um, you can uh, be a friend with us, uh, Facebook, Twitter. We tweet all the time. Um, we're all on the, the local stuff. We got smartphones and stuff, so we're good on that. Um, a couple things I want to share with you. Um, one more thing. Bruce, this Sunday at 9.30, um, the title is uh, Then. Uh, text is Matthew 24. Questions like, what does Jesus say about the end times? When will it come? How will we know? Um, will we get some um, traction in our understanding? It's this Sunday. If you're interested, show up. That's how it works. Cool deal. Okay, uh, Ecclesiastes. One thing I want you to think about is tonight. Um, food for thought for the week. Um, King Solomon, he is what they believe wrote Ecclesiastes. Um, Riches do that ever lived, ever will be. Um, he said, meaningless, everything is meaningless. Nothing is new under the sun. All streams flow into the sea, and yet the sea is not full. The eye has never enough seeing. What has been done will be done again. So as I pray aside, I want you, in this week, I encourage you to uh, think about what your meaning in your life is, how you worship God, and, and how will that meaning last once you're gone. Good deal. Um, feel pray with me. Uh, God, uh, thank you for tonight. God, thank you for the gifts, God, that you've given to our brothers and sisters, God. Thank you for uh, giving them the boldness, God, the courage to uh, share those, God, in faith. Um, I pray, God, that as your spirit dwelt here tonight, God, that it smiled, Father, that um, something new was uh, brought to someone's eyes, God, that they, they see the gift in their life, God, and how it can be used to glorify you, Father. Lord, I thank you for the new faces here tonight. Um, I thank you for, God, just the, the ability, God, for us to really reflect on how we stand in the way sometimes of your glory, God. And I pray that um, nights like this, God, are a reminder to us to just God, take the background, Father. Lord, I, I thank you. Um, and God, we give uh, your son um, praise and glory, God. In, in your name, uh, God, we ask these things. Amen. You're dismissed. I appreciate it. Have a good night.